Hi, uh, a very, very good morning, uh, good afternoon, or good evening, good night, whatever. Uh, depends upon the time when you watch this, uh, when you hear to this lecture. Uh, thanks to the COVID times, uh, we are now uh, doing most of our lectures online. And uh, here I am uh, recording this for uh, all of you. And probably one of the most important topics uh, from every perspective. Uh, this topic, uh, titled Periodontal Pocket, uh, <clears throat> is probably the most important topic that you will have to learn and remember uh, till you practice dentistry. It's the most common of all periodontal findings you will see in every patient or in most of the patients who walk into your practices with some kind of a dental complaint. Okay, so let's understand uh, periodontal pocket uh, is just not any other pocket what you see in your shirt or your trouser. It's a pocket that's seen in the patient's mouth uh, and you won't, don't actually see it. You actually seek it. You will observe it depending upon the patient's complaint and then you will check for its presence using a very specific tool known as the periodontal probe. So that's uh, a periodontal pocket for all of you. Let's understand uh, what do we mean by periodontal pocket. So this will be the parameters under which we will continue with the session. Uh, we'll have a definition, then we'll classify the pockets. We'll identify the various clinical features, the sign, symptoms and the signs. Uh, how does a periodontal pocket happen or occur or the etiopathogenesis of that? Uh, if you take a section of the pocket and observe it under the microscope, the histopathological version of the periodontal pocket, uh, the rate at which the disease progresses, site specificity, and everything else that goes along with that. Before we uh, start with the topic, uh, it's very important for us to understand a few things. And in that, the most important thing is, let's get this point very clear and understand uh, you all. And that's the important finding for all of us to remember is that periodontal diseases and most of the periodontal diseases that we encounter in a patient's mouth or the complaints of which the patients come to us primarily are inflammatory in origin. They are inflammatory in origin. It means that there is a causative agent that's causing an inflammatory reaction. And as a consequence of this inflammatory reaction, we start observing various signs and symptoms of the disease. And that's why periodontitis is primarily an inflammatory disease. And how do we define it? Please remember this definition. It's defined as an inflammatory disease of the periodontium characterized by progressive destruction of the tissue supporting the tooth. It means the tissue destruction is happening continuously as the patient suffers from it. It does not a one-off event and <clears throat> it can recur, okay? Few more important findings are very clear to understand. One, it's continuous, it is progressive, but it is not continuous. There's uh, two different terminologies. Progressive means it's happening all the time. Continuous is it's happening literally every minute. Pro the difference between progressive and continuous is progressive. It happens over a period of time. Continuously, it's happening all the time. So periodontal disease is progressive, but it is periodic. Means it has got what we call as episodes of exacerbation and episodes of remission. So it's like this, for example, you're driving a car, you drive at 120 kilometers per hour, and then you slow down, st start driving it at 60, and again, you start driving it at 120. That's what we call as, but your journey is continuous. Exactly in a similar manner, the periodontal disease process is a continuous process. It keeps on, you keep on moving, but at some point you move very fast, some points you move slow, but it's happening at all points in time. And very, very important thing is this. And as a consequence of the continual inflammatory process, the periodontal disease process is characterized by the loss of alveolar bone that holds the tooth. And then there's a pocket, there's a gap that gets created between the tooth and the alveolar bone or in the gingiva due to the loss of the bone or both of it. <clears throat> 
few things are very important. We all know this from our basic uh, lectures on gingiva, and that's more important for you to understand. There's something called as a gingival sulcus. The normal circular depth is in the range of one to three millimeters. Okay, that's what we call as a normal circular depth. Clinically healthy state, we call it as what we call as a clinically healthy state of two to three millimeters. On the other hand, when this depth starts becoming more than three millimeters, it means that this sulcus has gone deeper, and that's when we use the word periodontal pocket. How do we define a periodontal pocket? Please remember this. You should be able to recollect it at all points of time. The periodontal pocket is defined as a pathologically deep in gingival sulcus. Remember this word. Periodontal pocket is defined as a pathologically deep in gingival sulcus and is one of the most clinic, important clinical features of periodontal disease. Okay, it means that the sulcus can get deepened even due to non pathological processes. Let's keep them aside. But what's important for us to remember this is this periodontal pocket is defined as a pathologically deepened gingival sulcus. Okay. So how do we classify periodontal pocket? In simple terms, a periodontal pocket or any pocket rather is defined in two sections. One is a gingival pocket and a periodontal pocket. A gingival pocket is also known as a pseudo or a false pocket. And the true pocket is also known as a periodontal pocket proper. This periodontal pocket can be again further subdivided a superbony pocket and an intrabony pocket. Okay. So pocket is gingival pocket, periodontal pocket. The periodontal pocket is superbony and intrabony. Don't go by those words written underneath that one wall, two walls. We'll see that a bit more later. The gingival pocket, also known as a pseudo pocket, is formed as a consequence of gingival enlargement. <clears throat> But at no point, there is something what we call as loss of the alveolar bone. So you see this enlarged papilla here, that's a gingival pocket. But what happens when we do a gingival, when we see a gingival pocket, there's an increase in the size of the gingiva, but the underlying bone that is supporting the tooth is not lost. And that's why it is also known as a false pocket or a purely a gingival pocket. The sulcus is deepened. So if you take a probe and place it here, you'll find this circular depth more. But this circular depth is only due to overgrowth of the gingiva and not due to destruction of the alveolar bone or the apical migration of the junctional epithelium. Okay. So you can see here in this picture, the first picture here is what we call a gingival pocket. The junctional epithelium is at the cemento enamel junction. And then there's an increase in the size of the gingiva. On the other hand, when you start seeing the junctional epithelium mowing down on the root here, you see the JE is now, sorry, the first picture also shows the JE is now on the cementum. Uh, the cement enamel junction is exposed and this exposure here is what we call as a true pocket. And what you see on the root surface is a clear cut presence of what we call as the subgingival deposit. Okay. And as this rate of progression, as the JE starts moving more and more onto the cemental surface, the gingival margin starts going down. And this gap, what you see now between the gingiva and the tooth is what we call where the pocket is present. So you can take a probe and slide it down. And as a consequence of this, you'll also see that the level of the bone, which is normally two millimeters, the crest of the bone to the cemental enamel junction, which is around two millimeters, is now becoming more and more and you see I've seen different patterns of bone loss here. You see it's a horizontal bone loss. And here you see this bone loss is what we call as an angular pattern of bone loss. So let's go uh, further. <clears throat> so this pocket, uh, uh, the two pocket is further subclassified into what we call a simple compound and complex. Simple pocket is it involves only one surface of the tooth. For example, you consider the maxillary central incisor and on the buccal aspect. So you take a probe and you insert it on the mid buccal aspect of the central incisor. You see pocket only there, but you do not observe any deeper probing depths on the mesial, distal or on the palatal. So these kind of pockets are what we call as simple pockets. Pocket involving only one surface of the tooth. So it can be buccal, it can be mesial, it can be distal or it can be palatal, but never more than one. On the other hand, you have something called as compound pocket. Compound pocket involves more than one surface, okay? 
So what it means, so a patient can have a pocket on the buckle and it can extend to mesial. You can have a pocket on the buckle extending into the distal, palatal to mesial or a palatal to distal, but never running between buckle to palatal without the other side. So this is what we call as compound pocket. You can also have pocket surrounding the entire surface of the tooth. That's all around 360 degrees. Even then it becomes what we call as compound pocket. So you have pocket like a six mm depth, pocket on the buckle, mesial, distal, as well as palatal. So this type of pocket is also known as a compound pocket. It means that there's a pocket all around the tooth and all the four surfaces or two surfaces are continuous with each other. So that's what we call as a compound pocket pocket. On the other hand, there's something what we call as a complex pocket. A complex pocket is one where the complex pocket is one where you have what we call as the pocket. You can have a pocket on the buckle, you can have a pocket on the palatal, but there's no continuation through the mesial or the distal side. The pockets are communicating in between and this is what we call as a complex pocket okay and that's what uh, we are looking at especially uh, this type of pockets are observed or these types of pockets are observed on multi rooted teeth that's the upper and the lower molars so apart from uh, this clear classification there's one more what we call a supra bony pocket and an infra bony pocket also supra bony also is known as a supra crestal or a supra alveolar pocket Yeah, uh, coming back uh, to the other classification, that's what we call a supraboni and an infraboni pocket. The supraboni pocket uh, uh, is a consequence, is a consequence of what we call as a horizontal pattern of bone loss, whereas the, where the bottom of the pocket is coronal to the underlying alveolar bone. On the other hand, the infraboni pocket, also known as subcrestal or infraalveolar pocket, is where the bottom of the pocket is apical to the level of the adjacent alveolar bone and the lateral. Okay, I think we tuned out there for a minute. Yeah. Thanks for some network. Yes. Whereas the intro, uh, let's get back. Interbony pockets. Uh, let's get back to this. Types of pockets uh, again: uh, suprabony pocket and an infrabony pocket. The suprabony pocket also is known as a suprafrestal or supraalveolar pocket, where the bottom of the pocket is coronal to the underlying alveolar bone, whereas the infrabony pocket, where the bottom of the pocket is apical to the level of the adjacent. Let's look at this picture here so it makes your point very clear to understand. Yeah. Now, what you see here in the middle picture, okay, is a classical supra alveolar pocket or a supra bony pocket where the pocket, the base of the pocket, the point where the junction of epithelium is attaching onto the root, is known as the base of the pocket. So, this base of the pocket is coronal to the crest of the alveolar bone. So, this is the crest of the alveolar bone, and the base of the pocket is coronal coronal to the crest of the alveolar bone and this becomes a supra bony pocket. On the other hand, what do we see here? And this pattern of bone loss, what you see here is horizontal. You see the bone is horizontal. On the other hand, the one what you see here on the extreme uh, left of the screen is this. What we see is the bone loss uh, where you see this is an angular pattern of bone loss and the base of the pocket is apical to the crest of the bone. This is the crest of the bone and the base of the pocket is apical. The base of the pocket is apical to the crest of the bone. So this is the base of the pocket, this is the crest of the bone. So it's like this. And that's why when you put a probe down here, the probe, when you try and move the probe laterally, you will feel resistance from this piece of bone. So this is a suprabony pocket with a horizontal bone loss. This is what you see here, is an infrabony pocket with an angular pattern of bone loss. Infrabony pocket, angular bone loss. Suprabony pocket, horizontal bone loss. Okay, yeah, let's see uh, in brief a little bit about the various differences what you observe between a suprabony and an infrabony pocket. The suprabony pocket, uh, it's a very, very commonly asked question, and this is something what you all should be knowing. Uh, the suprabony pocket is something where the base of the pocket is coronal to the level of the alveolar bone, whereas in an infrabony pocket, the base is apical to the crest of the alveolar bone. Pattern of destruction, the alveolar bone is horizontal, pattern of destruction is vertical. 
The transeptal fibers, you know the transeptal fibers, they are the ones what are at the crest, top of the crest. They are arranged horizontally, whereas here the transeptal fibers are oblique. The very reason why they are horizontal is because the bone is horizontal, the fibers are arranged like this. Here the bone is vertical, angular, so the fibers are also arranged obliquely. On the facial and lingual surfaces, the predominant ligament fibers beneath the pocket follow the normal course, whereas here they follow the pattern of the angular bone wall. So that's the difference between a superbone and an infrabony uh, pocket. So let's just pause. Okay, yeah. Let's now uh, go to what we call as the <coughs> second part, understand the clinical features. Now, uh, most of the patients, uh, most of the patients that we encounter in our practice, uh, who are either referred to the periodontal clinic or to the ones who come to our clinics, individual private practices, uh, usually complain of two of the most common dental complaints. One is either bleeding from the gums or a foul odor or food getting stuck. Now, either of these three complaints would make you start thinking that can this patient be having a periodontal pocket? So the most common, the most common things that our patients are going to tell us, what we call as the symptoms. Before you actually see the patient, you just have to listen to the patient. That's why taking patient's history or recording the patient's history or her story is very, very important. So what you do when the patient comes to your clinic and you seat them on the chair, you just ask them, what brings you here? And in all likelihood, every patient who usually has a pocket will tell you either of these findings, either or, either or probably all of them. The most common one would be they would tell there is a very, very dirty or a foul odor in my mouth at some point. They'll probably point out on the cheek the way I'm doing right now on the screen. They'll probably point out and tell doctor, from this area, I get a very dirty, dirty kind of a smell. And when I put, and I feel like sticking my tongue there or probably using a toothpick to clean it out. So, and once I clean it, I feel a lot of relief. So that's the most common uh, thing that most of the patients who come to the clinic and who usually have pockets would give you that history. They would also probably tell you, doctor, I feel like taking a stick or a pen or anything like a toothpick and dig that gap, you know, I feel like digging it out and every time there's something like a digging process and then I feel gratified, it's a sense of gratification what they get after they're digging and I feel like doing that continuously through the day. And when they tell you that in all likelihood, it means there is a pocket in that particular area. Obviously, they'll also tell you uh, in all likelihood, doctor, I get pain, but the minute you ask them what kind of pain and they would tell you, doctor, I feel like it's a dull pain. I, do you feel like taking a painkiller? Then in all likelihood, the patient would say, doctor, I don't feel like taking the painkiller. It's not so bad. I can bear it, but it's like very dull. You know, it's through the day. I feel it makes me feel very uncomfortable, very irritable, but it doesn't take me, uh, make me to take a painkiller. That's what we call as a radiating, dull, deep seated pain. Okay. And then uh, very, very important is Sometimes I may get a, get a bit of pus or a very dirty fluid also coming in from that area. So these are the usual symptoms what most of the patients who come to the clinic uh, who have a pocket and also obviously they'll also tell Dr. Foot gets stuck every time I eat, bite something, it just goes and gets stuck in that particular area. So these are the most common symptoms that patients tell. That's like firm taste, uh, foot getting stuck, feeling like digging, uh, radiating dull deep pain, a gnawing feeling or itchiness or irritation kind of thing. And the minute you feel put a probe and clean that area, they feel a bit of gratification. So that's what most of the patients come. Obviously, they would also tell doctor, I do that and there's bleeding from the gums in that particular area. And the minute you ask how long, you have, you'll probably hear this from most of the patients that the minute you ask doctor, for how long you've been having this problem, Mr. or Mrs. Then they will tell doctor, it's been there for quite a few time now, quite a, some time, uh, probably a few months, sometimes some of them probably even telling you years. Okay, because the pain is not bothering, because the pain is not as severe as a pulpal pain, uh, all these patients would take it for granted that I think this pain would go away and that's why they tend to bear and live with this kind of pain. Okay, and the worst part is the longer they tell doctor, 
it's been there for a few years, then it means the kind of bone loss or the destruction that's probably taken place in that area is very, very bad and probably in all likelihood the tooth uh, may not survive. <clears throat> so when you as a clinician after taking this history or finishing your medical history and everything else, you take the patient back on the chair and start doing a clinical examination, what would you notice? In all likelihood, in all these patients, you obviously see all the signs of gingival inflammation that is change in color, contour, consistency, surface texture, uh, bleeding, very, very common is bleeding. The minute you touch that area, there's probably a spontaneous kind of a bleeding happening, okay? <clears throat> very important thing, the gingiva is usually bluish red, okay? It's a bluish reddish gingiva, uh, not very bright reddish, bluish reddish gingiva. And then uh, there's probably sometimes you take your uh, thumb and just put a little bit of digital pressure, then you probably also see a bit of exudation. And that's what you'd observe uh, in these patients, bluish red gingiva. Uh, there's probably a small spot of red here and there, gingiva bleeding, exudation. And in also all likelihood, if you ask the patient, uh, <clears throat> do you feel that uh, your teeth have moved from their position or have the gaps appeared between your teeth? All these patients who tell, yes, doctor, my teeth were actually initially very nice and tight. Over a period of time now, over a period of last six months, a year, year and a half, they started going away. There's gaps that are happening in areas where they were non-existent, something like what you see here on this picture. Okay, and that's what we'll tell you. Probably also tell the doctor, my teeth are strong now. I feel that moving around, uh, they moved out from their position. So they tend to give a lot of these issues, extrusion, migration of the teeth. Sometimes you won't say, Doctor, the same thing happened like that, only one of my other teeth it became, it started shaking and eventually it fell off on its own. So these are various uh, signs and symptoms of someone who's got a periodontal pocket. Tooth mobility is very, very common and so is diastema. Okay. <clears throat> okay. So once you've uh, seen to the history, the next thing is how would you identify? The most identifiable and the most common and the best way to identify a periodontal pocket is known as the process called periodontal probing. Okay, uh, please understand periodontal probing is a very diligent process. You're supposed to do it diligently using a very specific instrument known as a periodontal probe. Okay, now what's a periodontal probe? Periodontal probe is nothing but a normal probe what you use but the tip of this instrument is rounded or it can have a ball head at the tip here. This tip of the probe can be rounded or a ball head, okay? And the next important thing, what you see on all these probes is very important finding that there are markings, okay? There are markings telling you the depth in millimeters. So you have a, a probe which can mark from zero to 10, it can have from six to nine, or so some even have 15 or 20 mm markings. So what's important is, to know the probe with which you are probing, okay? The characteristics are very simple. There's a contraangle head, okay? There's an angulated head. The probe, the actual measuring part bends 90 degree. And then this probe has got markings. Now, most common markings are one, two, three, four, five to 10. Some may have till 15. Now, how do you probe a particular area? The most important thing for one to understand when you probe is you take the probe and you insert it in the pocket or in this gap between the gingiva and the tooth. So, and how do you insert it? You use a certain amount of force. And what's the amount of force that you use? It's exactly the same amount of force which, with which you would get a blanching on your thumbnail here. So if I take a probe and put pressure on this thumbnail, the minute I start seeing blanching here, that's exactly the amount of force that you're supposed to apply while you're probing a particular area. And how do you probe? This process of probing around the tooth is also known as walking the probe. You know, uh, the elderly, how they walk, they take a walking stick and go at every point, they keep on planting it. And then once they feel they're comfortable, then they take the step. So exactly in a similar manner, you do the probing process. And how what is known as the name of the probing process to check for pockets is known as walking of the probe. You walk like using a walking stick. So at walk, where all you would walk, you walk all around the tooth, but you would measure the pocket depth. The pocket depth is measured at four different points. That is on the mesial, on the mid buckle, the mesobuckle, the distal buckle, and on the lingual. Okay, so you measure on all these four sides, mid buckle, mid palatal, 
middling goal. You can call it as mesial and distal. So at four points, you measure the probing pocket depth. But while you're probing, you go all around the tool surface using the force that's going to cause a certain amount of blanching on your thumbnail. So that's if this is my thumbnail, and if this is the amount of force that's causing blanching, so I'm going to use that. In specific terms, it's around 25 grams of force, what you want to apply onto the probe. Okay, and when you do this, the probe would go between the tooth and it would rest at this point. Where would the probe rest? The probe would rest at this point known as the base of the pocket. And this height, what you would measure from this base of the pocket to the crest of the gingival margin is your pocket depth. The depth of the pocket is measured from the crest of the gingival margin to the base of the pocket. And the number that you see is always written down on your sheet. Okay, now the probing uh, depth, <coughs> it measures the depth of the pocket. There's also one more terminology that you'll have to remember. And that terminology is known as what we call as the clinical attachment loss. That's the specific terminology that shows the how much amount of product ligament attachment has been lost because probing depth tells us the soft tissue height whereas the clinical attachment loss tells us the amount of bone and product ligament loss on the root surface that's from the cement enamel junction and apical to it so you can have a 10 mm pocket and a 6 mm cal clinical attachment loss because the remaining four is the enlarged piece of the gingiva which is not significant for us okay so there are two terminologies one is probing depth and the other is clinical attachment level so what we see here uh, one second let me just come on give me a minute Just a Okay, so we will start with this. Yeah. So now, uh, when we look at uh, probing of the periodontal pocket, just give me a minute to solve this. Yeah. Let's look at the uh, probing of uh, periodontal pocket. Uh, there are two types of uh, probing depths, uh, which are told. Uh, at undergraduate level, uh, okay, there's something called a biological or histological depth. Okay, it's a distance between the ginger margin and the base of the pocket. That's what we call as actual probing depth, probing pocket depth, PPD, also known as a uh, PPD. So that's one. The second uh, is what we call as a clinical probing depth. Okay, so this is distance from ginger margin to the base of the uh, uh, pocket. Let's leave this. Yeah. The difference between the histological depth and the clinical probing depth is clinically where the probe ends is exactly the point where you measure. Histologically, you have to actually take a section and see the measurement and that's when it's called histological. So let's don't dwell more deep into this. What's important for you to remember is remember this word, probing pocket depth and the clinical attachment level. Okay, so how do we probe uh, the probing depth? Uh, also, obviously, the measurement of the probing depends upon various factors. The most important one is the size of the probe. That's why we have to use conventionally what we call as the actual periodontal probe, which is got a round end, rounded tip, or a what you call a ball head. Okay, then apart from that, what you require is what we call the force with which the probe is inserted. So that's why it's very important that you check the amount of force that you need to create blanching on your thumb and you use only that much force. The more the force you use, obviously you'll get deeper the pockets. The direction of penetration, the probe always has to be inserted around the long axis of the tooth. Okay, in the interproximal areas, you have to insert it at an angle and then straighten it. 
and then whatever measurement you get you have to subtract one millimeter from that and that's actual probing because you have to counter for the angulation of the probe so if i am measuring easily and distal my probe is going like this so probably if i measure six then i straighten it out it still says six then my angulation my actual probing depth in that area is five that is six minus one okay and then obviously also depends upon the resistance of the tissues the crown position etc which are the other factors which would determine the uh, what you call the probing depth that you would measure okay so next uh, if we come to the factors uh, what show uh, what is the difference between the how does the clinical finding as well as the uh, what you call the histological finding of a periodontal pocket differ okay clinically what you would see for example the gingiva appears uh, different degrees of bluishness redness or flaccidity or soft or this one Clin histologically, if you take a section from that area and observe the microscope, what you'd observe, you'd observe that there is a venous stagnation. You'll see cells within the substance of the vessels. Uh, okay. And then more importantly, the epithelium would start showing signs of atrophy and then edema. So obviously the intracellular space would be increased and filled with, filled with completely a lot of blood cells. If the gingival wall appears pink, so for example, uh, see the, the periodontal pockets are what we call at times as healing lesions. I was describing to you the word, what we call as a progression, okay, or phases of exacerbation and remission. If the pocket is in a phase of remission, the gingival wall will look pink and firm. And similarly, histologically, these uh, areas will see a lot of fibrotic changes. The amount of inflammatory cells is relatively lesser, but it doesn't mean the destruction is not happening. The destruction is a continual process, but the rate of destruction is probably a bit slower. Uh, apart from that bleeding, so when you take a probe and elicit bleeding, then it means that obviously histologically you will see a lot of engorged vessels and a lot of inflammatory cells within that. Okay. A patient feels pain, then in all likelihood that is a site which is going for ulceration. Okay, so that's what you would see the difference between your histological and this one. Very, very important factor now to understand for all of us is how does a pocket form? What is the pathogenesis of a periodontal pocket? Okay, uh, this is something that you have to remember and very, very important uh, in understanding the entire concept of periodontal disease and periodontal disease progression. Now, what do we mean by pathogenesis? How the disease starts, how does it progress and how does it end? That's what we call as this pathogenesis. Okay, now we all have to understand that periodontal diseases are primarily caused by bacteria and so it's an inflammatory process. Just like every inflammatory process, initially the inflammation causes a certain amount of damage. If it, the cause is not removed, in our case the oral bacterial control is not done, then the disease progresses to the next level, then the next. Okay, so what's happening with the periodontal pocket is this. Initially, every periodontal disease or every periodontal pocket starts with what we call as a gingival inflammation. So, for example, today we have a patient who have, whom we have taken, uh, in whom we've done a scaling and polishing and there's no bacteria in the mouth, okay? This patient is clean enough. On the other hand, if this patient doesn't maintain a hygiene and he starts accumulating bacteria on the surface of the teeth, then he will go into what we call as the initial lesion early lesion and an established lesion over the next three to six months. So the stages of gingivitis, what we learned in third year, the same thing repeats. Initially, there's just a small inflammation. Then the inflammation becomes larger, then it becomes chronic, okay? So established lesion is nothing but what we call as a chronic inflammatory state of the gingiva. Till established lesion, the junctional epithelial attachment, the junctional epithelial attachment is still at the cemento enamel junction. The GE is at the cemento enamel junction the bone, the allular bone is at the same level. Only thing that is inflamed here right now is the gingiva and nothing else. On the other hand, on the other hand, at this established stage, if the patient undergoes a scaling procedure or there's a reduction in the bacterial numbers, the patient goes back to a state of health. So if the patient comes back to you at six or a month or one year and you redo the scaling and then the hygiene is re-established and patient starts to meet in good hygiene, then the patient stays in gingival inflammation state only. On the other hand, the patient doesn't maintain or there is a change in the bacterial flora. What I mean by the change in the bacterial flora, we have to understand 
that the oral microorganisms can be virulent and commensals. If there is a change in the bacterial flora, either by higher number of bacteria or addition of very virulent organisms, then in that situation, then what we see is the disease which was in what we call as an established gingivitis then goes into a phase of what we call as an advanced gingivitis. And this process of conversion of gingival inflammation from an established gingival lesion to what we call as the advanced lesion is nothing but the pathogenesis of formation of a periodontal pocket. So as the text uh, shows here, periodontal pocket starts as an inflammatory change in the connective tissue. And as this connective tissue starts getting destroyed, we have to understand that the inflammation that we see, the inflammatory process that we see in the gingiva in chronic inflammation also means that the tissue is under continuous assault. What is the assault here? The assault is from the host derived production. Now what's happening is the bacteria are present on the tooth surface. There's no bacteria which is present in the tissue. The bacteria, all the microorganisms are present in the form of plaque on the surface of the tooth. Now, why are we having inflammatory response? The body is trying to react in such a manner that it can sell the, send the neutrophils out of the uh, gingival connective tissue into the root surface and kill the bacteria there. Now, if the neutrophils, which all cross over into the gingival sulcus and attack the bacteria and kill them, that's very good. On the other hand, now there are neutrophils which are unable to pass over into the gingival crevice, but they're then breaking down within the gingival connective tissue itself. Okay, and this process of the gingival destruction happening by the host derived products is what is going to cause the gingival or the pocket formation. So let's just go back to this picture, what I have here. Now let me put this picture for all of you. Yeah. Let's just go back and see this picture. Give me a second. Yeah, just put this picture for you to make you understand Let's get this picture and you will understand here this. Now what's happening is the subgingival, the pathogenesis of the platform of what we call as pocket formation starts here. Okay, this is the tooth surface, the subgingival deposits and microorganisms here. Okay, and then this is the gingival connective tissue. Okay, and then is the bone uh, underneath deeper down here and then you have the periodontal element attachment and this what we see is the junction of epithelium. Now what we're seeing here is the bacteria which are present here are going to be killed by cells which are going to come down from here. Now all the neutrophils which are coming into the from the vessels into the connective tissue area you have to understand the gingival blood vessels here. Okay these blood vessels due to the signals coming from the neutrophils are trying to move out but all those neutrophils which don't move out here but they're getting here they also die you have to understand every cell in the human body has got a certain lifespan now once a neutrophil uh, finishes its lifespan and cannot move out and kill the bacteria here is breaking down here and as the neutrophils start breaking down within the substance of the connective tissue here what happens they start causing what you call as the connective tissue destruction and this connective tissue destruction, which what we call is a mechanism by host destruction is going to lead to what we call loss of the collagen fibers. Now, what are these uh, enzymes that are being released by these dying neutrophils within the substance? They're nothing but what we call as collagenases and matric, other metalloproteases. Now, what happens is they start causing destruction of the host collagen. Secondly, there are also fibroblasts. We have to understand there's a normal turnover also happening with the tissue. So the fibroblasts, which normally degrade the collagen fibers, they are also present. So they're degrading the collagen fibers. So due to this double destruction that's happening of the gingival connective tissue fibers within the substance of the connective tissue, the tissue becomes weak. So what happens? It starts in collagenase. 
And as the collagen loss starts happening, at the lower end, or what we call as the, at the apical end of the uh, tissue here. So for example, let's put this picture for you. Yeah, this makes life easier. So let's put this picture. So now, as we see here, now in this picture, you see, this is the apical end. Now, if all the collagen fibers, which are present here in this area, the supraalveolar connective tissue fibers, as they start getting destroyed, the cells of the JE, which are being supported by the fibers here, they start losing their support. And then what happens, the JE starts moving down from the cement to enamel junction, all the way down onto the cementum, right? It is the cement to enamel junction, then start moving down. As the JE starts moving down onto the cemental surface, okay, then the further pocketing formation process starts. So what happens now, as the JE starts moving down onto the cemental surface, okay, the cells of the JE, you know, there are different layers of the JE cells. So cells of the JE are in different layers. There is the split in the JE cells and due to this split in the cells of the JE, then what happens? There is a formation of the pocket. So what is the process as described in your book is very simple. It says there's a proliferation of the cells of the JE. As the JE cells proliferate, the cells at the lower border split. And when this happens, it happens when the percentage of neutrophils, the percentage of neutrophils within the gingival connective tissue has to reach 60%. So at 60% of neutrophils in the gingival connective tissue, the tissue loses its cohesiveness the support to the JE from the gingival fibers goes and the JE starts moving on apically. And as this process happens, there is formation of a pocket. The initial pocket happens between the JE and the tooth, whereas later, initially there's a pocket happening between the JE and the tooth. And as a later date, the cells of the JE, which are present here, they split and then there's a pocket formation happening further deeper within the cells of the JE. And this entire process of movement this entire process of movement of the JE from the cemento enamel junction onto the cemental surface and inflammatory process in the gingival connective tissue where 60% of gingival connective tissue is now filled with neutrophils is known as what we call the formation of the pathogenesis of the prodontic pocket. Simultaneously, as this is happening in the soft tissue, the alveolar crest, what do we mean here? They are simultaneously at the same point when the J is migrating onto the cemental surface, simultaneously there is bone destruction that's happening concomitantly at the same point. And that's why as the J moves down, there's also the loss of the alveolar bone crest. And this process is known as what we call as a process of formation of the periodontal pocket. And this is what you'll have to remember. So let's just go back to certain numbers here. What's important, remember, the junctional epithelium, there is inflammation, there's established stage of gingivitis. There is junctional epithelium, uh, which is present at the cemento enamel junction initially. And as the 60% of the gingival connective tissue gets replaced with uh, neutrophils, the, the dead and dying neutrophils start releasing their enzymes, primarily collagenases. These collagenases start eating down the gingival connective tissue. And this leads to loss of support for the apical cells of the JE. And that's when the apical cells of the JE start moving down. And as they move down, they split. And that's when you get a gap between the periodontal, between the tooth surface and the junctional epithelium. And this process is known as what we call the process of formation of the periodontal pocket. Along with that, there's also concomitant loss of the alveolar bone. And that's why whenever you see a patient with a pocket, you'll also see that the crest of the alveolar bone in these areas is also moved apically. So it's a dual process. The JE moves down onto the cemental surface and the alveolar crest also undergoes apical movement, depending on whether it's a horizontal bone loss or it's an angular pattern of bone loss. This is what we call as the process of pathogenesis of the periodontal pocket. Okay, so the various theories, I don't think we need to know uh, at this at the undergraduate level, so we'll skip these things. Okay. Next, uh, we move down on what we call as the, uh, the logical features of the periodontal pocket. Uh, 
don't need all this. Yeah. So once we have a parental pocket, what we see is the epithelium that lines the entire parental pocket is known as a pocket epithelium, which in physiological state was known as cell epithelium, is now known as the pocket epithelium. And what we see in a pocket epithelium, we see that the intercellular space is larger, it becomes more permeable, and so that more and more cells can go in. Okay, so that's what you would see in a pocket epithelium. So we close this here and then we'll come back. Uh, so, uh, okay. so uh, the last part uh, of this lecture is on what does a pocket contain and how does it appear histologically. <clears throat> So parental pocket, uh, if you see it clinically, uh, and you try and make a section of this, what you would see, you would see a few of these followings. Number one, uh, you will see that there is a lot of plaque or microorganisms in the pocket. So you take a curette and put it in a pocket and take it out and observe it under a microscope. That's what you would see. You would see microorganisms and products, uh, which include enzymes, various endotoxins, etc. Obviously, there is injal clavicular fluid, and at times <clears throat> you'll also see what we call as exudation, and sometimes if the pocket is very deep and it's got secondary infected, then you can even see pus coming out from a pocket. Obviously, there is going to be some and decent amount of food debris, and a lot of times that's a complaint with which most of the patients would have come in, that is food getting stuck between the teeth and the gums. Okay, uh, you'll also, if you do a chemical analysis, you'll probably see some uh, mucin, etc. Histopathologically, what you would see, uh, the soft tissue side, if you take a section of the pocket and observe it under the microscope, what you will see, the soft tissue side uh, would show you ulceration. The epithelium would have, the pocket epithelium, uh, which was earlier known as cell epithelium, would show signs of ulceration. Uh, it will show signs of lipid degeneration, some amount of PMNs in there, uh, destroyed the collagen fibers, bleeding within the substance of the connective tissue, and engorged vessels. So that's what you would see here. Ulcerations, bleeding, a lot of neutrophils, uh, destroyed collagen fibers. Uh, so these are what we call a characteristic features of the soft tissue side of the parental pocket. Uh, one of the things we have to also understand, uh, as I was describing to you earlier, on when does the shift from an established to an early lesion happens, primarily happens when there is a change in the microflora. And what do we mean by that? Uh, either there's an increase in the microflora, number of bacteria becomes too high. Secondly, or if there's a change in the virulence patterns of the organisms. So what have been observed very commonly is that uh, there's a change from gram positive to gram negative organisms. Uh, there's an increase of movement of the bacteria from cocci to rods. Uh, we have started seeing a lot of motile organisms, primarily spirochetes. Uh, more of anaerobic organisms and also those organisms which uh, are proteolytic in nature. Initially, the plaque is always fermenting, that is acid producing. Now what we see here is primarily all proteolytic the enzymes produced by the bacteria which can break down the host cells. So if you observe the same pocket wall under uh, electron microscope, what you see is uh, described as a microtopography of the gingival wall of the pocket. Uh, we see areas of related equations, areas of bacterial accumulation. You can see all those on the slides there. Just remember these headings that should be good enough at your level. Uh, areas of emergence of leukocytes, okay? And areas of leukocyte bacterial interaction, and then areas of epithelial discommission. The same thing what you see uh, under light microscope, if you observe it under an electron microscope, this is how it's been described. Uh, that is areas of uh, related equations. So if the deeper area, there's nothing much happening. Then you have areas of bacterial accumulation on the cells. Then there's emergence of leukocytes. So where the, the leukocytes are coming out at that point, the point where the leukocyte and the bacteria interact. So as the leukocyte is coming out of the gingival connective tissue into the sulcus, and where the bacteria are present in the sulcus, so the point where they're interacting, that's there. And then areas of epithelial discommission, that's basically where you start seeing micro ulceration, and then areas of hemorrhage. 
So these are the things what you would see on a uh, electron microscope. Also, one of the important things as we described earlier is the periodontal pocket uh, or the periodontal pocket formation is a progressive process, uh, what we, but not continuous. What we mean by that is that, as we said, there are periods in pocket formation phases which are exacerbative and which are remittive in the sense the pocket formation is happening continuously but as I described to you earlier, on a highway, you are driving at some distance at 120 kilometers per hour, then some distance at 30 kilometers per hour, and then again at 120. So there is exacerbation and remission. So when the pocket undergoes these uh, various changes at or various degrees of destruction or remission, okay, so the periodontal pocket also appears clinically exactly in a similar manner. If it is undergoing a phase of exacerbation, you will see that the gingival wall or the pocket wall is completely inflamed, bleeds on touch. Uh, you can see a lot of bacteria, a lot of plaque in that area. Okay, and all signs of classical inflammation are there. On the other hand, if the pocket is in a remission phase, a phase where uh, <clears throat> the host defense or the body's immune system has been strong enough to mount a decent defense against the bacteria, then what we are observing? We are observing that these pockets start appearing as a more of a healing lesions. So in this time, what happens is the pocket appears more fibrotic. So even though if you put a probe and it would measure a six or eight mm, the outside pocket wall appears more pinkish, less amount of inflammation, little or no exudation and some amount of bleeding. Whereas in an exacerbative state, it's completely opposite. All signs of inflammation, bluish, red, soft, edematous, all those things would be there. So that's the reason why periodontal pockets are also known as what we call as healing lesions. Means it undergoes a damage destruction and then undergoes healing. But always we have to understand the rate of healing is always lesser than the amount of destruction. And that's why once someone has a pocket or a bone loss and does not undergo clinical interventions, eventually over a period of time, the patient would lose that particular tooth due to continual degenerative or bone loss process. Okay, so what does a pocket contain? A uh, pocket would contain the same things as we described, uh, this uh, composition. Okay, the same thing what we see uh, uh, in the microtopography, but in a macroscope. One of the important things about uh, pus, now we have to understand this pus or exudation. It's very important for us to designate or rather differentiate between what is pus and what is exudation. In all likelihood, if you take your finger and then put a little bit of pressure, digital pressure on the pocket wall, you'd always see some whitish fluid coming out. In all likelihood, that is an exudation, okay? Whereas a pus would be a localized collection of fluid which is lined by membrane. So most of the pockets would show you certain amount of exudation rather than pus. So please, you should, it's very important for you to differentiate what is pus and what is exudation, okay? The way we have the changes on the soft tissue wall, similarly, the changes are happening on the root surface wall also. And these uh, changes on the root surface walls would be described as areas of decalcification and demineralization, okay? And then the areas of increased mineralization, areas of demineralization, areas of cementum covered by calculus, and then there's plaque. Now, what happens is because the bacteria are attaching onto the cementum surface, because the JE is already mowed on the cementum is getting exposed, the bacteria also cause destruction of the cementum. The cementum is gone. And then when the cementum goes, there is calculus formation. The plaque undergoes mineralization. The calculus is attaching onto the cementum surface. Okay. <clears throat> and because the cementum is very, very thin, the acellular cementum at the surface is very, very thin, it is easily removed by the action of the plaque organisms. And that's why you probably not see any cementum. So these are areas where what we call as, and also the periodontal limb fibers, which were attached to the cementum are also being destroyed by the bacterial enzymes. And that's why we see what we call as areas of pathological granules, destroyed collagen fibers, which appear as blobs on the root surface are known as areas of pathological granules. So this is what you would see on the lateral aspect. So this is the tooth surface. If you see from top where the sulcus is all the way to the bottom, you would see calculus, you'll see areas of attached plaque, areas of unattached plaque, areas where the JE is attached, and below the JE, you will start seeing partially lysed connective tissue fibers. Okay, so that's how would be the pocket wall. This is the root surface wall, and this would be the soft tissue wall. 
very very important for you to understand uh, uh, as i was describing much earlier uh, in the recording is the same thing that periodontal disease process or activity is not a con is not a continual process it's a progressive process okay what it means you have areas of quiescence or the periods of exacerbation and most of these things are determined by host community and the bacterial growth or the bacterial colonization happening in that particular area so someone who's got a pocket uh, comes to you a clinic you want to do a scaling root cleaning polishing and reinforce of hygiene and patient maintains it well in all likelihood the pocket will undergo a remission phase on the other hand the patient has a pocket and would not care for it that particular patient will probably have more exacerbative phases than the patient who underwent a clinical intervention one of the important things about pocket is it's site specific uh, what it means so for example if i have a 36 and there are pockets which are present on all the three side four sides of a tooth the pocket on the lingual side may progress at a different rate as compared to the pocket on the mesial or on the distal or on the buccal side so the decision the ability of the pocket to progress become more deeper or undergo exacerbation or remission literally depends upon the microorganisms and the host defense at that particular site that's why periodontal pockets are very high degree of site specificity uh, what's the relation between pocket depth and bone loss very very important at the same time when we are telling that there is formation of a pocket and the je is moving apically onto the cementum exactly at the same time concomitantly there is bone loss that's happening on the bone over side so formation of the pocket and destruction of the bone at the crest both are happening simultaneously okay so let's just go back and summarize uh, this chapter uh, let's very very uh, importantly understand what's a periodontal pocket periodontal pocket is nothing but a pathologically deep and gingival sulcus secondary to apical migration of the junction epithelium what it means unless the je has moved apically from the cementum and enamel junction onto the cementum we don't call it a po true pocket you always call it as a false pocket uh, we classify it as gingival pocket and a periodontal pocket that is a pseudo and a false pocket pseudo pocket and a true pocket the true pocket is again a supra bony and an intra bony and it can be again be as simple component complex a uh, very important for you to remember is a pocket is measured uh, with a periodontal probe the various signs and symptoms of periodontal pocket have been very clearly mentioned there's uh, remember this table uh, what you're seeing on the screen that's uh, differences between a supra bony and an intra bony pocket very important from a clinical perspective okay and then uh, understand the probing is always done using a specific instrument known as periodontal probe which has got a ball head or a rounded tip and can measure anywhere in the range of Uh, 10 to 15 from 0 all the way up to 15 mm a normal gingival depth is 3 mm anything more than that uh, should be called as a pocket whether it is true or false you have to depend upon the clinical evaluation so that's uh, it about parental pocket so we close the session here and then we'll meet some time again thank you so much so i'll just stop the recording